So this is uh, Northbridge and it connects the old town on the far side there with the, what's called the new town and we've guided quite a lot of the, the old town and uh, that bridge was uh, started in 1769 uh, to be built. The 18th century bridge uh, unfortunately collapsed and they had to put up a new one which is an 18th century bridge so it seems to have lasted uh, also. That's the main connection called North Bridge. Uh, just up to the right, just I think Joe's uh, just had a little glance of the Balmoral Hotel. Family North British, it was a railway company hotel because it was close to the main railway station. And the clock is, of course, three minutes fast. Now, a connection we may not have mentioned, uh, because it's three minutes fast, it is because to catch your train in time. But also J.K. Rowling uh, finished the final book in the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter on the Deathly Hallows, and... Uh, you speak to the concierge nicely, they might actually let you have a wee look around the room where she spent some time writing that book. So if we swing around, we've got on my right hand side here is uh, General Register House. And this is where the Civic Records of Scotland were originally kept. And this uh, building dates back to uh, quite a long time ago, 1752, they started building it. And it was the first real public building of Edinburgh's new town. It was a move to improve conditions, to improve the conditions of the records of Scotland which were being kept at Edinburgh Castle and then the old Parliament. It was getting quite damp so this was one of the first buildings to have underfloor heating. And today hatches, matches, dispatches, births, marriages and deaths uh, are retained here if you want to check on your Scottish ancestry you can come and visit here also and have a free guided one hour walkthrough. The building is what we call a neoclassical style of architecture, a kind of blend of Roman and Greek motifs designed by Robert Adam. And towards the bottom, it's much heavier, what we call rustication, where you can really appreciate the big heavy stone blocks. And as you move higher up, it gets uh, much smoother up at the top. Now, a connection that maybe a lot of people don't actually know about was the man who happened to attain uh, the first manned aerial flight uh, over uh, Britain in a hot air balloon, uh, exhibited his balloon and it was uh, called the Grand Edinburgh Fire Balloon and in 1784 uh, he had this balloon on exhibit within the unfinished register house because they'd run out of money, they couldn't afford to put the dome on and he used that arena to have people to come and look at it and charge them six pence a time to come and view this hot air balloon. And it was flown over Edinburgh. Now, um, he wasn't the first to have an aerial flight in a hot air balloon, the Montgolfier brothers in France but he was certainly the first one in Britain and is sometimes not spoken about very much for that achievement. He managed to get that balloon up to about uh, 350 feet which is about well over 100 metres and it flew for half a mile uh, from Holyrood Park in Edinburgh over to Restal Lake and it was creating a huge sensation. Now, James Tytler was his name. He was born in Angus. He was uh, seen as a bit of an eccentric. He was a writer. He was a contributor to the Encyclopedia Britannica. He was a surgeon, an apothecary, and he also wrote music for the Highland Bagpipe. So he was a jack of all trades. Unfortunately, uh, well, his first uh, flight was the most successful. He did another one, and even more people turned out, but it didn't get up as high, didn't fly as far, and then the third one was a bit of a disaster. But uh, nonetheless, a record-breaking figure, again, of Edinburgh's history, James Tytler. Now, we're just going to move, and, uh, oh yes, J uh, Joe's reminding me, famous character is the Duke of Wellington from uh, the Battle of Waterloo, and he was Prime Minister of uh, Britain as well, and this amazing statue by John Steele. Uh, John Steele had uh, created many sculptures throughout Edinburgh and on his horse Copenhagen and Copenhagen was so well loved that he got a state burial and is buried very close to where the Duke of Wellington is. Now this 
it commemorates the number of people who lost their lives in the Napoleonic Wars because there's many Scots who did so. So a very important memorial. And uh, just beyond here is Waterloo Place behind this monument. So we're going to swing around and have a look ahead of us at the Scott Monument. 200 feet high that. Now I was talking about James Teitler, how far he got. He got about 350 odd feet high. So if you look at that monument today, think about two thirds of that again from the peak. And that was the height that uh, James Teitler Grand Edinburgh Fire Balloon attained. Amazing. This was an old building. Uh, it was uh, used by a company called Woolworths, a departmental store, uh, for many years. And then it was gutted, they took the interior out, replaced it uh, with the high-tech interior. But unfortunately, one of the walls collapsed. <laughs> and if you just look along to the left-hand side, you can see there's a bit of old wall on the left. They wanted to keep that wall there, but it collapsed just a few years ago, so they had to build another wall. And many of the locals will make a journey along this little street here to come to a cafe called Snacks Cafe. And they make some of the best sandwiches that you can get. I used to, well, still do play the bagpipes, but I used to do a bit of street entertaining with the bagpipes. And halfway through, you would find all the pipers in Snacks Cafe. Uh, close, closing now, but there it is on the right hand side. So, we are heading up this little back street. On the right hand side you can see the voodoo rooms, this is part of the Café Royal complex. The Café Royal is what we call a Victorian Baroque building and you can see as you look higher up you have got some uh, quite elegant decorative architecture. Victorian Baroque, uh, it's a Parisian, it's like a Parisian cafe. If you go inside, it's an oyster bar too. You can have your champagne and oysters in there. And if you look above the sign, you can see that lobster, because that is certainly one of the things you can have if you go to the Café Royal. But it's also a famous local pub, but not just locals. When people get off the train, they can come over here and enjoy the elegant interiors. The oyster bar is separate from the main public bar. And the public bar has got these great horseshoe shaped booths where you can get together with your friends and enjoy. And you may actually see some of the huge range of uh, whiskies on the gantry there. Now, this building was opened in 1860 and it wasn't meant to be a pub. <laughs> It was a gas showroom and sanitary wear because the people of Edinburgh's new town were getting into having nice internal bathrooms and that was the idea, it was going to be a showroom for that but then it never became that and when the older Café Royal on the other side of the street went out of business and was uh, demolished and this one took over and it's, it's very fine. Now, would you believe in 1969 it was going to be demolished because the Woolworth store on the other side were wanting to extend the premises and there was a petition out to save it. And thankfully, it's still here today. Back in the 1960s, they weren't as careful about some of the beautiful architecture as uh, we are today. Inside, though you may not see them very well, are ceramic tiles produced by the Doulton factory uh, for an inventor's exhibition in 1865 in London and also uh, in, uh, they were possibly exhibited at the International Exhibition in Edinburgh uh, in 1886. Uh, sorry, 1886, it was 1885, the inventor's exhibition and uh, they were showcasing industrial achievement and the Dilton tile pictures within the Café Royale show people like Benjamin Franklin and his printing, William Caxton, Michael Faraday, great inventors and people of discovery. So, uh, wonderful interior. One of these buildings that are pubs and bars used to be having other purposes like insurance uh, companies like the one, the red sandstone one, uh, just ahead of us there. Very elegant with the statues also.
we're coming into St Andrew's Square and you may see this big tall pillar on the left hand side. Now that pillar is 150 feet high. It was uh, put there by architect William Byrne and it's a copy of Trajan's column in Rome. Floated col uh, pillar. When it was put up, the shopkeepers, the people who had businesses as well as residents were very nervous because it's such a high column that it was going to collapse. So they brought in Robert Stevenson, grandfather of Robert Louis Stevenson, famous Stevenson lighthouse designers to create the foundations for this big heavy tall monument. If you had a heavy tall monument like that, it would to commemorate quite a powerful man. The powerful man was Viscount Melville, Henry Dundas. Now, Henry Dundas has been in the media quite a bit just now because of the Black Lives Matter movement. Because we know he was in, involved with legislation infecting slavery. Now, the economies of uh, Great Britain, Scotland included, were very much uh, relying on slavery, unfortunately, because we had uh, huge trade with sugar, tobacco and cotton. And there was what we called the triangular trade. Because of trade winds, it was easier to go south to Africa, cross the Atlantic over to the Americas, and then come back again. So you were exporting, uh, taking goods to Africa, and in exchange you were getting uh, slaves. And uh, the slaves were then took over to uh, America and they were sold on to pick cotton and uh, tobacco and all of that. So uh, it was a very involved situation. Now, uh, Henry Dundas was a uh, world advocate. He was very high up in the legal profession here in Edinburgh. And he had a part to play in the liberation of a slave. And this slave was called Joseph Knight. And in the 18th century, John Weatherburn, who happened to have plantations, uh, went uh, over to these lands to work them and would have slaves there. And he brought uh, Joseph Knight back to Scotland with him to work on his estate. And Joseph Knight got married. And Joseph Knight wishes wished to have his freedom and uh, he, John Wedderburn wasn't going to allow that and there was a famous uh, legal case where uh, Joseph Knight had Henry Nandas representing him as counsel and helped him to attain his freedom uh, and uh, famously Dundas, Henry Dundas made the quote uh, no man should have power of, on the ownership of any other man but there's another side to Henry Dundas that maybe we're a bit more aware of today, and that is the fact that he delayed an act which was called the Slave Trade Act of 1807. And he delayed it. And the reason was um, that he thought a gradual change against slavery was better than an immediate change because of the economy of this country that was his beliefs, and uh, it was delayed. And he has been criticised in the present Black Lives Matter situation for that move of delaying it and making a gradual transition. But the Slave Trade Act did actually uh, come into being. And it was in uh, 1807 that uh, the, it came in. And that disallowed people to be trading in slaves, but it didn't abolish slavery altogether. And it was much later that that actually happened in 1833. So it's a very long process. But today, uh, up in the top of that uh, pillar here, uh, stands uh, Lord, Mel Lord Melville. He was uh, First Lord of the Admiralty, Treasurer to the Navy. He was in one of the first politicians to be impeached for irregularity um, and uh, he was also um, you know, he was just very high up in the government of Scotland he's Home Secretary under William Pitt and he was also 
uh, the chief man. He was actually nicknamed Harry the Ninth because he exerted great power. Okay, we're going to turn around now and look at Dundas House. Very elegant mansion house uh, owned by Sir Lawrence Dundas, who was a distant relation of Henry Dundas. And he upset many people in Edinburgh's new town because James Craig, who Joe will be talking about, was a town planner. And to improve conditions for people, this regular gridiron street formation of what we know as a new town today uh, merited a church in the site to balance with another church on the other end of the, t the town on the eastern uh, side, on the western side. And he uh, built this much to the annoyance of uh, James Craig and many of the other people who had wanted a symmetrical, balanced uh, street plan. And looking at it, at the front of this building, which is now a branch of uh, NatWest, it, uh, it's not now the Royal Bank of Scotland, it's NatWest, um, is his original house. And it is in what we call the Palladian style of architecture, if you look at the columns they are in what we call Corinthian style at the top, the capitals there, and the pediment at the top, uh, was when it was an excise office. Uh, Lawrence and Das didn't last very long after its, after its completion. It wasn't lived in much as a house, but then it passed into the hands of the government as the excise office. And if you look carefully, there's a fleur de lis, uh, the symbol of France, because uh, the monarch of Great Britain had claimed to France up until 1801. Uh, until the Treaty of Amiens. It then uh, passed into the hands of the Royal Bank of Scotland. Royal Bank of Scotland founded in 1727, not the oldest bank, and uh, they got their hands on it. And uh, they wanted it because they were worried when it became vacant that the Bank of Scotland was going to occupy it, because the Bank of Scotland were nearby. So to enable them, power they bought this uh, building, very beautiful it is today. Uh, it's based on Marble Hill, uh, outside Twickenham, which was a much a copied a mansion house. And uh, there's a lot of building kind of very similar to this, but it's a beautiful gem of Edinburgh's architecture. And just in front of it, you can see the fourth Earl of Hopeton, who was a hero of the Napoleonic Peninsula War, as well as one of the governors of the Royal Bank of Scotland. Uh, the Hope family are still quite prominent today in Scotland. Uh, they made their money from coal mining. And of course the name Hope Town uh, became very common. So, beautiful gardens here in the forecourt of Dundas House. I'm going to walk by Harvey Nichols, part of the store on the right hand side. It's not been that long since Harvey Nichols moved down here, but the no more we move down this way, the more we get to the high-end retail sector uh, of Edinburgh. There's many designer shops. And Harvey Nichols, if you want to get a really picturesque location for having your tea or coffee or afternoon tea up the top there, it's got panoramic views over the city. 1603, we had uh, the Union of the Crowns when James VI became also uh, King of England and, of course, of Great Britain. But in 1707, Scotland lost its parliament and many wealthy, powerful people left Edinburgh because it was really the old town. That was all that was there, an overcrowded old town with disease and contagion and whatever. So they wanted to clean up the act of Edinburgh. So they started building this new town in 1767 on the plan of James Craig. Another view of the Melville Monument. Now that uh, figure at the top, who is Lord Melville, who I spoke about earlier, um, if you saw that monument close, if you went up there, not that you would be very dangerous, the brow and features of his face are greatly exaggerated because it's to be seen from below. So there's a kind of foreshortening that the sculptor put in place. Hotel used to be the house of Henry Broham. Uh, Henry Broham was uh, a member of parliament. He was Lord Chancellor and credited with the longest speech in history in the House of Commons, which was six hours, would you believe? He was a politician. 
Uh, he was a very admired man. He was a liberal, and he was very much against slavery. And he had a lot to do with the abolition of slavery act in the 19th century. Now, the first act was uh, to do with slave trade, and it actually stopped people um, encouraging trading of slaves to put a stop to it. But slavery did still continue, and it continued abroad. It didn't put a stop to it because many Scottish people uh, had huge plantations, were immensely wealthy, and had estates all over the place, including the East India Company, which took even longer through that organisation because they encouraged the, the use of slaves in their economy too. So Henry Brougham realised that uh, an absolute end to slavery had to come about, so he had a lot to do with uh, that act coming into place. Now, in the early 19th century, 1833 it came in, uh, the Abolition of Slavery Act. Now, what happened there is it was a payoff where plantation owners, people who owned slaves, would be given money uh, by the government to stop them using slaves. So that was uh, a more helpful way to do it. Now, Scotland was, its economy, I must say, was founded in slavery. None of us are innocent of that. And it is in our unfortunate history that the economy relied on it. And these politicians were doing all they could sometimes to help their wealthy friends, but at the same time, they didn't want the economy of the country to collapse. So, a very complicated situation. Henry Brougham famously defended Queen Caroline. He invented the Brougham carriage, you may be familiar with, a light, small carriage. And also, he founded the resort of Cannes in the south of France because he happened to go there quite a lot as a retreat. And he died there and it became very fashionable and popular. So Henry Brougham, again, a great character, a great political figure, and uh, quite a liberal mind. He also was one of those who founded the Edinburgh Review, and the students of Dougal Stewart, who talked about earlier when we were on Carlton Hill, on Thistle Street, named after the National Flower of Scotland, which is the thistle, and maybe you can see the wee thistle badge I've got there. Of course, the rose is the national flower of England. And while we're at badges, a wee view, view of the S Scottish Tourist Guides Association blue badge, because Joe and I are members of that association, and we guide groups safely and sustainably. And uh, as local guides, we just love guiding this amazing city. Now, if you look to the left, We've got Thistle Court, and this was one of the first, if not the first house of Edinburgh's new town, uh, planned in 1767, and uh, it was developed by a man called James Young, and we've got the name Young Street connected with this man too. Uh, unusual in that uh, there's a courtyard, and if we move further down here, today it's, an office, it's offices, but it used to be somebody's house. It's an open courtyard which tends to go against the fashion of Edinburgh's new town, which was supposed to be series of uh, parallel streets and not really so much like small courtyards and squares. This is more similar to the old town of Edinburgh, but a very quaint house it is today and its offices. But if you look at the other house, you're never going to believe what this is. This is an electricity substation, which used to be a residence here in Thistle Court.